It is such a joy to welcome Audrey and Perry Sakai, whom you may know as grandparents of Alice and Anna Malhotra, <laughs> mother to me, mother and father of Mia and, and Mark Malhotra. We are so delighted that you're joining us this morning to bring the word. Thank you. Good morning, St. Paul's. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you, choir, for the, wow, wonderful, wonderful music for this morning. Um, yes, we are grandparents to Anna and Alice, and we normally come here to jo join you when they are singing in the choir. But actually, um, we have ties to St. Paul's that predate Mark and Mia coming here to worship with you. So, <clears throat> I actually grew up here in this area. Um, San Mateo was my home where I was raised as a child. I went to all the schools here. I went to Aragon High School, if any of you from there. <laughs> <laughs> I was here, and we, as a child, I would go shopping downtown where Equinox used to be J.C. Penney's, <laughs> and Wells Fargo used to be iMagnon. Maybe some of you were here in those days. And um, so when when Mark and Mia decided to come here to live and make St. Paul's their home, it was really kind of like a home for me as well. So um, we just um, have always felt your warmth and welcoming, and we're just so happy to share here with you today. Um, actually, <laughs> it was 50 years ago, <laughs> when I was in high school, that one of my closest friends attended St. Paul's. And she was not from a really religious family or anything, but she found her way into your community and felt that this was a welcoming space. So I remembered that from 50 years ago. And I'm so grateful that I get to be with you and um, have been spending time in your services and to get to experience the very thing that she did, Claudia, 50 years ago. <laughs> and so as, as you know, we're, we're sitting here at this just amazing convergence of our, um, our family's connection with you here at St. Paul's, but also considering our lifelong journey where the Lord has brought us. And we realize that Jesus invites us to move closer to him with a willing heart. And it is this invitation that caught our attention when Reverend Sarah read from Mark's gospel. And we meet James and John, the sons of Zebedee, two of Jesus' most beloved disciples. In the very most intimate times, Jesus would call these two, James and John, to be close to him. And we see this when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He called James and John to be, uh, James and John to be with him in that moment. When Jesus went up to the mountain to meet God the Father, he called James and John to be close to him. And at that Thursday evening, late Thursday evening, when Jesus struggled and, and, and struggled over the, what was going to be happening, unfolding to him over the next two days or the next day, he called James and John to be with him at the Garden of Gethsemane. So, I can imagine that the early Christians, the early church, 
when they saw James and John, they regarded these two as like their heroes. They were like the heroes of the faith. And as Jesus predicted, they both did drink the cup of suffering that Jesus drank. They both were baptized with the baptism that Jesus was baptized with. We see in Acts 12 that James was martyred by King Herod for preaching the good news of Jesus. And then we see that John, John wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote three letters. But then we see that he was exiled on the island of Patmos, and there he wrote the book of Revelations. And these two men are heroes of our faith because they are examples for us of ones who are willing to, to suffer and sacrifice so much for the good news of Jesus. And it was because of their willing hearts that they drew close to Jesus. That was what, drew, that was what motivated them. And so, as we were contemplating this passage, I kept wondering, what were these two like in the beginning? What were they like in the beginning? Because I'm not certain that they started out as heroes of the faith. I think they just started out, and we get a glimpse of that, I think, in this passage. And actually, when I was reading their story, their, this passage and their story was a, it was a real great se sense of hope for us. <laughs> that, it was a great sense of hope for us. So they started out in the beginning. They were following Jesus for about three years. They witnessed healing of the sick. They witnessed cleansing of lepers. They witnessed raising of the dead. They witnessed all these miracles. And they wanted to be close to Jesus. They just wanted to be close to Jesus. So we hear their request that they made of Jesus. Lord, after you suffer and die and rise again, grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in your glory. So when I read this, I started wondering, hmm, I wonder what their motivation was. What was, what, were, what was behind this question, this request? Was it because they wanted to be close because they just loved being with Jesus so much? Or was there another reason? And it's not said outright, but judging from the reaction from the other 10 disciples, I think we could get a glimpse of what their motivations were. I think their motives were a little bit selfish. Because when the disciples, other disciples, heard about this, they got angry and an argument broke out among them. And while they're arguing, Jesus speaks and says these words. You know that among Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them but is not so among you. Those who wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. And then Jesus makes this amazing statement, this amazing statement. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mic drop, right? Bam. <laughs> so in this interchange, we see that James and John, perhaps they wanted to be close to Jesus for more selfish reasons. Because in their world at that time, being close to power meant you had access to power. You had access to influence. You had access to authority. 
But Jesus showed them another way. And Jesus' way was being close to Jesus meant not waiting to be served, but instead to be willing to serve others. And the great part of their story is that later in James and John's life, they got it. They understood this. And we could see it because for James, this path took him to, to become a martyr. And for John, this path took him to be exiled on the island of Pathos, Patmos. These two men understood what Jesus meant. They finally got it. Out of a heart of love, Jesus, the Son of Man, became Son of God, became man, and lived in kinship with humankind. And out of the heart of love, Jesus, the Chosen One, gave his life as a ransom for many. James and John followed Jesus' way and drew close to him out of love. Jesus was willing to become man and enter into kinship among us, with us. He came not to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many. And James and John were willing to go to those in the margins of Jerusalem, of Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the Roman Empire. And they went out to be in kinship with those in the margins. They went to be served. They did not go to be served. They went to serve and become followers of Jesus among them. Audrey and I, we've been married for 44 years. And God continues to change and transform us. But as we look back and as we were thinking about our time with you this morning, one day, one day in, in our married life stands out more than any other day as a day that changed our lives forever. So, uh, speaking of a James and John story, we have that story <laughs> in our life. And I can um, pinpoint of the very day that it happened, uh, in 1983. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, we were newly married in 1980. We were living in Richmond, California, and Perry was working with his family business and working with his dad every day. And um, there was one day when I decided to go and have lunch with them. So uh, I was driving my car, and as I was approaching my father-in-law's house, I saw a line of people, a family, walking in one single file on the sidewalk right in front of my father-in-law's house. And they were dressed in the most unusual clothes I had ever seen, ever seen. <laughs> Uh, this black turban and this big red ruffly pom-pom kind of thing. I mean, embroidery, it was a sight. And I was, I was just captivated. Who are these people I'm driving along? <laughs> they were so different from anyone I had ever seen. And before I knew it, I saw them and they turned the corner and they went into the apartment right next door to my father-in-law. They were neighbors to my father-in-law. They were right in proximity. And I just thought, what? <laughs> where, where on this planet did they arrive from? Because I was raised, we were raised in a very sheltered little bubble of our Japanese-American community. Um, I think as, as a result from the World War II experience of being incarcerated and feeling 
vulnerable. We really, our parents and grandparents really huddled together. And we, we established, well, my grandparents and parents established church, family, friends, our culture, everything all together. And we stayed in that safe little bubble. And that's how I grew up. But seeing these people was like not anything of my experience. So it led me to great curiosity. And amazingly, the way God works, <laughs> a few weeks after that, I got a phone call from a good friend of mine. And she said, Audrey, my church has just sponsored a refugee family from Laos. Would you like to come and visit them with me at their apartment? And I, refugees from Laos, I had to look on the map to see where Laos was. <laughs> so I joined her, and from there, my world changed. They were the same people, the same ethnic group from the hill tribes of Laos uh, called the Mian people. And it was the same one who was my, my father-in-law's neighbor. And as I got to know them, I learned about their unbelievable story. And maybe some of you have learned and known about refugee stories, their arduous journey from the mountains of Laos, crossing Thailand and to our country, not knowing anything. Along the way, they lost their homes, lost their villages. Um, even family members who died or killed through the Vietnam War. Um, and they came with nothing, just the clothes that they could carry on their backs. And so I was so moved. Perry and I entered into this world that just was so overwhelming with all their needs, and we just jumped in. And um, I think the feeling at that time was, how could we turn our back when we have so much and they have nothing? We have privilege, they have nothing. Um, what else? We were just, uh, we had access to power. They didn't have access to power. We kind of felt like, whoa, we need to help these people. There's almost pity, you know? It was, of course, mixed with some benevolence and altruism, but there definitely was the sense we have it and they don't. And um, we continued this for quite a while until the one day that everything changed, another big day. <laughs> and this was um, in October of 1983 when our world came crashing down. And I was two months pregnant. And um, in October, I miscarried. And the experience of the miscarriage just took me in this tailspin of great grief and loss and sadness crying days and days and days, just could not stop crying. I didn't, I felt so alone and broken. But who were the ones who came alongside me in that moment? It was our Mian friends who came and extended their hand of compassion to me, tears even with them in their eyes, and they knew they knew grief, they knew pain, they knew loss, they knew sadness. And in that moment, I felt in kinship with them. I felt uh, like a shared humanity with them. It was no longer this feeling of, I have something to give to them, but it was that we, could, we were serving each other. And I think I got a little glimpse of what Jesus was saying to his disciples in that moment. 
And um, there's someone else so special. And his name is Father Greg Boyle. I don't know, some of you may know him. Yeah, a Jesuit priest in LA who um, works with uh, ex-gang members, formerly incarcerated folk. He said something so profound. And um, let me see if I can. And he said, um, the measure of our compassion lies not in our service to those who are um, on the margins, but it's only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. And um, this word kinship, I just uh, love that word. The dictionary says kinship is the relationship between members of the same family. <laughs> in that moment, I saw that I, was, I shared in the same family as my Mian friends, that we were kin, that we were kin and we belonged to each other, that we shared our identity in this human race, <laughs> that we could serve each other. Um, I think this is what Jesus means when he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And he shows us the way in his example and his ultimate sacrifice on the cross um, to show what it means to be a servant and for him to join into our humanity, to be kin to us, so that we might serve each other. Uh, this is the long, lifelong journey of learning what that means and how to be more and more like Jesus. This was our beginning. <laughs> Thank you. So beloved, perhaps you're at the beginning of your journey, or perhaps you've been on this journey for many, many years. It is our hope, it is our hope that you know deep in your heart the wonderful good news, Jesus Christ, Son of God, who is willing to enter into our world, not to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many. It is our hope that you follow in the footsteps of James and John as they turned away from the way of this world and they turned towards the way of Jesus. So our question, Audrey and I, our question to you is how are you willing to live? How are you willing to live? Are you willing to enter into kinship with your neighbors, especially those who live in the margins here in Burlingame, San Mateo County, the Bay Area, and beyond? Are you willing to pay attention to those in the margin, to be aware? And are you willing to enter into kinship with them? In a few moments, Reverend Sarah will be serving us Christ's body and Christ's blood in the New Covenant. And this is the highlight of our time together worshiping God. This is the highlight. And so in that moment, when you come to the Lord's table to be served by Reverend Sarah, <coughs> and all those who are helping her. I invite you to be aware of the person who is on your right and on your left. Just be aware of them. Just be aware of them. And in that awareness, just take a moment to just say a blessing on the one on your right and the one on your left. Because if you do, if you do, this could be your next step 
to following Jesus' way. Because once you begin to be, get in the practice of being aware of who's on your right and on your left, and that you get in the practice of saying a blessing on them, who knows where, what is going to happen next? Only God knows. Only God knows what's going to happen next. God bless you, St. Paul.